Well, please do me a favor and find Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2. Be found in uh, chapter 2 of Titus, verses 11 through 15. Please stand with me. I'd like to read to you the Word of God. Hear now the words of our holy, loving, wise, and sovereign God. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And thus ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Thanks be unto God for his word. Well, please join me in prayer, for we'll need the Lord's help. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for making known to us what we could have never known apart from your revealing grace. We ask that you would cause the scales to fall from our eyes as you did the Apostle Paul. Remove our ignorance, remove our unbelief, get it out of the way, O oh Lord. May the cupboards of our hearts be stocked full, filled with your precious word of truth. Our great God and Savior, please win for yourself glory this morning as you furnish our faith with love and knowledge and repentance. Save the lost, O Lord, and cause your people to recognize once again your holy grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Redeemer. Amen. So all the way back in chapter 1 of Titus, verses 1 through 4, Paul introduced himself, and then he greeted Titus, his son in the faith. And then in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 21, it's basically verse 5 to the end of the chapter for chapter 1, Paul then reminded Titus of why it is that Paul left Titus in Crete. Well, first of all, Titus was to remain there so that he could appoint pastors. And second, he was left there to contend against false teachers. And that brings us to chapter 2 of Titus, verses 1 through 10. This is where Paul urges Titus to set before the Christians in Crete godly qualities or Christ-honoring virtues that ought to be present in the lives of believers and increasing in the lives of believers. First to the older men, and then he addresses the older women, and then the younger women, and then the younger men, and then lastly to slaves. And then this brings us right up to our passage this morning, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Remember, this is where Paul explains the source, the source and the support for all the godly qualities, all the Christ-honoring virtues mentioned above. The source and the support for all of these is the gospel. It's the gospel, the gospel of grace, the good news of salvation that was fully accomplished by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it is received only by faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation 
by grace, through faith in Christ, is the great root system. It's the great root system that is able to produce and nourish all Christian virtues and all Christians. As we learned last Sunday, Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Jesus, the Son of God, is the grace of God. Therefore, when the Son of God appeared in human flesh, God's grace, God's unobligated kindness, God's helping generosity appeared in human flesh when Jesus appeared in human flesh. In fact, earlier in our service this morning, we heard John the Apostle say basically the same thing. Just listen again to 1 John 4, verses 9 through 10, and just listen to the similarities. Paul says in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Listen to 1 John 4, 9 through 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest, appeared, was brought to light among us, that God sent his only son into the world. In this, the love of God was made manifest, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation It's a fancy theological term that means wrath-bearing sacrifice for our sins. Listen to the same point made abundantly clear uh, in the gospel according to John. So the same human author, the same Holy Spirit, spoke the same truths in John chapter 1, verses 14, 16, and 17. Just listen again. And the Word of God became flesh, the Word being Jesus. The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. What is He full of? Full of grace and truth. We have seen His glory, He who is full of grace and truth. For from His fullness, from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So, the grace of God appeared through the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he condescended and took on flesh, bowing the heavens and coming to our rescue, keeping the law for us, dying a cursed death on the cross, and rising again on the third day. And what did the grace of God bring when he, when he appeared? Bringing salvation for all people. So this is the saving grace of God, not the common grace of God. This is the grace of God that hauled in, carted in, brought in right, glorious chariots of salvation, so to say. Salvation for sinners. That guilty, the guilty, can be forgiven that they can be counted righteous with the righteousness of Christ, that they can be reconciled to God permanently and irrevocably, irreversibly reconciled to God. And this saving grace is for all kinds of people, from all sorts of ranks and situations. God's saving grace in Jesus, his Son, is for a whole world of sinners, as many as there are stars in the sky and sand on the seashore. So what is it that appeared? Well, you know, the grace of God has appeared. Why has the grace of God appeared? It appeared bringing salvation for all people. But that's not the only thing that the saving grace of God brought. Not the only thing that it came to accomplish. We're going to look at today the second reason for why God's grace appeared. So I'm going to ask the question again, I guess to be monotonous. So here's the question again, and it's on the back of your bulletin. Why has God's grace appeared? Last Sunday, from Titus 2.11, it appeared bringing salvation for all people. This Sunday, this Sunday's point from Titus 2.12-13, is this. 
it appeared bringing training for God's people. So it appeared to bring salvation for all sorts of people, and it appeared bringing training for God's people. The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people and training for us. That's what the text says, verse 12, and training for us, training us for something. Now, did you notice the word training? We've got to talk about that. And did you notice who the training is for? Well, behind the word training in the ESV, if you have a different version, it may say teaching. Nevertheless, Paul used the same Greek word that he used in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, when addressing fathers regarding their responsibility toward their children. So Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Paideia, the paideia of the Lord. So the discipline. So this training is a disciplinary training. This teaching isn't just informative. It tries to shape other things. It tries to discipline other things. And the us, the us that we read is directly referring to, yes, Paul and Titus, but it is, it is also implicitly referring to all other Christians, all other believers in Jesus Christ as well. So, God's saving grace in Christ doesn't merely justify and forgive guilty sinners. It, doesn't just, it does that, but not only that. God's saving grace also trains and disciplines the same people that it justifies and forgives. That's very important. God's saving grace both makes Christians and trains them to live like Christians. God's grace does both. Or you can think of it this way. God's grace, or God by his grace, adopts his condemned enemies into his family. How does God do this? He does it by his grace. And then God, by his grace, parents his adopted children to grow up in Christ. That's what it's teaching. This ought to bring to mind Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. And I'm going to read it to you in full. This is what the scriptures say. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. Now, Paul, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Why, or he's about, he's about to quote scripture. Why? He wants to prove a point. And what scripture does he quote? Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. So here he goes. Here's something that they may have forgotten that addresses them as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Did you catch that? He disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. That's Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, and Hebrews continues to go. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. Do you hear that? God is treating them as sons. He's treating us as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed good to them. But he, our God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness 
to those who have been trained by it. God saves his people by his special grace and love, and he disciplines and trains those very same people with his special grace and love. When preaching on this passage, Charles Spurgeon gave this helpful observation. He said this, Paul does not talk about a kind of grace that would leave men in sin and yet save them from sin's punishment. No, 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 no. Paul's salvation, the salvation that Paul proclaims is salvation from sin. He does not talk about a free grace that winks at iniquity and makes nothing of transgression. Oh, but a A greater grace, he speaks of, a far greater grace which denounces the iniquity and condemns the transgression and then delivers the victim of it from the habit of sin which has brought him into bondage. So what Spurgeon pulls out of this text for us and shows us, this is what's here, is that there is no such thing as God simply forgiving and not sanctifying, simply justifying and not changing those he justifies. That that doesn't happen. If God changes your status from condemned to forgiven, he's going to change your behavior as well. He's going to change your behavior as well. A person cannot remain the same after the grace of God. Just like how I could not remain the same if I got hit by a semi-truck. My friends, Paul, he can preach a gospel which promises that sinners are saved by faith in in Jesus' sufficient work apart from any performance of the sinner, apart from any law-keeping of the sinner, and yet, and in no way does that same gospel that Paul's preaching, in no way does it give license to sin, permission or warrant to go and sin all the more that grace may abound. Romans 6, 1 and verse 15 as well. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 15, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Here's the Apostle Paul's very short answer. That he, has, he has a long answer in Romans, but I'll just quote the short answer. By no means. <laughs> no. No, absolutely not. Listen to Paul's other short answer, but in Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, and training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's grace appeared to save and to discipline the saved. That's, please understand that. Please understand that. Now, from this point on, I would like to point out to you the two major things that the grace of God trains God's people to do. There's two major things. Let me just point them out to you, and then we'll go through them. First, followers of Christ or recipients of God's saving grace, they are trained to renounce, to say no to certain mindsets to certain qualities, or you could call these qualities corrupt ways of living. That's the first thing. Second, followers of Christ, recipients of God's saving grace, they are trained to live, to practice, to say yes to certain attitudes, to certain virtues, or Christ-honoring life habits. Let me just point them out to you a little bit more clearly. So, the first section of training is that God's saving grace trains us to renounce. And that's on the back of your bulletin. That should be the middle, one of the middle points. It's really a sub point underneath. I only really have one point in the sermon. And this is a sub point to that. The main point is that God's grace appeared bringing training for God's people. And now I want to answer the question, what training? Training to do what? Well, to renounce, to deny, 
to say no. To say no to what? Ungodliness and worldly passions. What is ungodliness? Well, ungodliness is thoughtlessness towards God. Ungodliness is forgetfulness of God. Ungodly living is to live as if God doesn't exist. That's ungodliness. You either refuse to think about God altogether, that's ungodliness, or you refuse to think about God as he truly is, as he's made himself known in his word. That's ungodliness, disregarding God in the world he created, disregarding him, ignoring him, rejecting him. This is Romans 1, 18, also verse 21 and verse 28. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now listen to how Paul unpacks ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. For although, this is verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And it gets deeper, verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, that's ungodliness. Sorry. Are you okay, Michael? What about you, Robin? Okay. So in Romans 1, Paul brings up the word ungodliness, and he unpacks that word to say, their foolish hearts were darkened, their thinking became futile, they refused to honor God as God or give thanks to him. And then in verse 28, he unpacks it to its very foundational level, and he says, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God. That's ungodliness. They said, why should I think about him? What did God do? He gave them up to a debased mind, a mind that can't pass the test to do what ought, what, to do what ought not to be done. That's ungodliness. The grace of God that saves us also trains us to abandon this to abandon this thoughtlessness, this forgetfulness of God, this ignoring of him and rejecting him. We learn to abandon that. So is the grace of God training you to put away such thinking? Is the grace of God training you to put away such living? My friends, if you're not receiving this kind of training from God's grace, then you have legitimate reasons to believe that you also haven't received salvation from God's grace either. I hope that makes sense. I'll try to say it clear. If you're not seeing the training, you shouldn't think that you have the salvation. Also, according to Titus 2.12, the grace of God that saves us also trains us to say no to worldly passions. And what are these? What our worldly passions. Well, Jerry Bridges, he explained that worldly passions are excessive desires for and an obsession with the things of this life, such as possessions, prestige, pleasure, power. Those things, when, when someone attaches latches on to one of those things and says, this is, I need this. I can't be happy without these possessions or that prestige or that power or these pleasures. I need this. The Lord would call that worldly passions. And this just brings to mind Philippians 3.19, which says this. Paul, speaking of the enemies of the cross of Christ, he says their end, their end goal is destruction. Their God is is their belly. The seat of their affections is their God. They worship their affections. 
They worship their cravings. And they glory in their shame. And he says, with minds set on earthly things. With minds set on earthly things. Only God, by grace, can rescue you from the penalty of ungodliness and the penalty of worldly passions. And only the grace of God can teach you to renounce and forsake such things. So are you learning to put to death ungodliness? Are you learning to put to death worldly passions? Are you learning to turn away from those disregarding thoughts and those selfish longings? Do you have an ev- sorry, do they, those worldly passions and that ungodly mindset, do they have an ever weakening grip on your heart? God's grace has a mighty and purifying effect. It does on those that, that it saves. It can melt a heart of stone. It can surely reveal the ugliness of sin. It can, in fact, reverse our love for sin. God's grace can cause us to stop romanticizing evil. It can, it can expose the... <laughs> it can cause us to lose a taste for it. What seemed to be like morsels of delight now seem like bitter rocks, and we don't want to taste that much more. It's like the grace of God is this, this potion that if you, if you drink it, if you, if you embrace it and take it in, it opens your eyes and you realize you were living in a fantasy world. You were living in a cage thinking that you had the whole world as an oyster to you. Now the second section of training is that God's grace trains us to live. So it trains us to renounce, it trains us to live. And there are four things here that God's saving grace trains us to do. To live out self-control, godliness, or I should, I should put uprightness there, godliness, and then waiting for Christ's return. So let's go through those four things. To live self-controlled, it says. We've already spent a lot of time on this, on self-control, because of how many times it's been brought up as a Christian virtue in the verses above by Paul. So I'll just give a very quick reminder. Living a self-control, in a self-controlled manner. Living in a self-controlled manner is mainly concerned with living in a wise, sober, content way. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Word of God says in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Self-control is a glad submission to God. It's believing and doing what God says with a cheerful heart. That's self-control. I know how to pull back on desires that I shouldn't let go of, and I, I need to rein those in because I'm idolizing something. But I also know how to push my desires forward, like stop being so lackadaisical. Get on with it. Want this. That's self-control. To live self-controlled and upright. Living in, up, in an upright manner, living a life that is upright, has to do, most of all, with our dealings and our relationships with other people. It's being just. It's being lawful. It's being fair. It's being righteous, as God defines. Not as we may say righteousness is or fairness is. I'm not saying that. Living an upright life means fleeing from dishonesty, fleeing from selfishness. It relies on God's explanation of what is loving, what is right in any given situation. It sticks to God's word. Uprightness also doesn't make judgments on what is right and wrong based upon our feelings. It doesn't say, my feelings here are the standard. It says, no, 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 God's word is the standard, and I need to conform my feelings to match, to come into alignment with the word of God. Just because I feel like that's insulting or rude or wrong doesn't make it so. This is God's world, not Danny's world. I mean, how, how obtuse of me, how proud I would be to say, my feelings trump yours. My feelings matter Yours don't. Mine are the standard. 
submit to my feelings. We have an objective standard outside of ourselves that we are to submit to, and it's not our feelings inside of us. It's the Word of God outside of us, my friends. So, uprightness strictly sticks to God's Word as the standard, and it's quick to obey. And you'll see it all throughout the Scriptures. You'll see it all throughout. Just, just take a nice walk through the Old Testament, and you'll find example after example of people who are in situations that their feelings go this way, but the Word of God says go this way, so they go, I'm going this way. That's uprightness. Now, the text goes on to say to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives. Godly lives in this present age, in the present age, it says. So if godly, if godlessness is thoughtlessness towards God, then godliness is thoughtfulness towards God. It's thinking that is profoundly Godward. It's being heavenly minded. It's seeking that which is above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Colossians 3, 1 through 2. Being heavenly minded, setting your mind on things above, this is Godward thinking. This is godly. As Spurgeon said, every man who has the grace of God in him, indeed and of a truth, will think much of God. Much in the sense of, I think he's great, but also I spend a lot of time thinking about God. He will think much of God. He will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God will enter into all his calculations. God's presence will be his joy. God's strength will be his confidence. God's providence will be his inheritance. God's glory will be the chief end of his being. God's law, the guide of his conversation. So to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, and he goes on to say, waiting. That's the next thing that God's grace trains us to do, to wait. Waiting for our blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The kind of life that God's saving grace trains, trains us to practice, also involves waiting. Waiting with eagerness, waiting with anticipation, a looking forward to our happy hope. You see where it says blessed hope? That's happy. Happy hope. A joyful expectation. We are looking forward with, with, with expectation of this joyful arriving when the one who is the very grace of God will appear again, and at his final appearing, he will shine in the great and marvelous, splendid glory. For he is our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, we are God's people, saved by God's grace, and we are Think about our position. We are wedged in between two appearings. Behind us is the appearance of God's grace, bringing salvation for all people and training for God's people. Before us, though, is the appearance of God's glory, bringing resurrection and eternal, uh, eternity and the new heavens and the new earth. Think of Hebrews 9.28. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The appearance of grace behind us was the appearance of God's Son, Jesus Christ, in human flesh. To do what? Well, to be our suffering substitute, to live, die, rise again, ascend on high to rule and advance his kingdom and gospel. The appearance of glory that we are awaiting will be the appearing of God's Son, Jesus Christ, in human flesh as our victorious conqueror. To raise the dead, to hand his enemies over to their, the eternal consequences of their choices, as well as comfort his people with a never-ending joy and a perfected creation without the curse of sin and with no possibility of it ever breaking down or ever coming to ruin. That's marvelous, my friends. That's why Paul's happy. That's why we ought to be a happy people. We have a joy set before us. We have this happy hope. Jesus 
is our hope. And we're waiting for our hope to arrive in bodily presence and human flesh for us. Because when he does, he's going to raise the dead. He's going to take care of his enemies and our enemies. He's going to comfort us with a kind of joy that we could only just try to imagine but not ever get there. Jesus is very God, a very God. Jesus is the grace of God. Jesus is the glory of God. And Jesus is our blessed hope, our happy hope. Has the grace of God already begun to work these qualities into you? I mean, are you learning self-control? Are you putting on more and more uprightness in the way you deal with others? Are your thoughts Godward? Are you thoughtful of God? Is he ever-present in your thoughts and in your choices? Are you looking forward to the day when Jesus comes in glory? I mean, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God? That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. What kind of people ought you to be? Now, I do have some application, and my application are just verses. So the first verse, the first application is this. It's Job chapter 31, verse 14. Just write the reference in the blank if you're taking notes. Write the reference, and you can, you can listen to me say it now and look it up later and check it out. Job 31, 14. Here's what Job says, and these are questions that I pray that God would just sear into our hearts. Listen to these questions. What then shall I do when God rises up? When he makes inquiry, what shall I answer him? My friends, if you're, if you're unbelieving, if you're unbelieving, this, you can be elderly and you can be a young'un. If you're unbelieving, I need you to realize you're playing a dangerous game with your unbelief. I mean, I'm trying to think of illustrations to to get across what it is that you're doing. Think of it this way. In your unbelief, you are plucking the whiskers out of a sleeping lion. And you think he's dead. You think that lion's dead. I can do what I want to it. What shall you do when he arises? He knows your thoughts. He knows your desires. He knows the life you're living. He sees your unrepentant heart. He sees your doubts, how you think, oh, this word of God is foolish. It can't be so. How can God be against the very things that I love? There must not be a God. Let me forget about him. What shall you do when he arises? When he looks at your life and he weighs it in the scale and he says, condemned, what will you answer him? Have you prepared a smart elk response? You will not be able to deliver it. Your tongue will fail you in that day. What shall you do when the Lord arises? Well, unbeliever, may the coming of Christ fill you with fear and turn you back to his rising in the past to his resurrection. What shall you do? He lived, died, and rose again to take away his people's sins and bring them back to him. If God, God, if you justify by the work of Christ, justify me. I know my works. This, right before this verse, Job is thinking, if I mistreated my maidservants, if I, if I mistreated my, the slaves in my household, And I try to cover that up. What will I do when God rises up against me? What will I answer him when he points out his inquiry? I see you've done this, Job. And believer, what shall you do when God rises up? What are you going to do? If the way that you're living right now is shameful, turn from your shame to his forgiveness. Turn from depravity to his grace. If, you, if you're a fellow struggler, 
as I am with sin. Where's your hope? Is it Jesus? Don't take your eyes off of him. And believer, hear this warning as well. Think of this, think of this question that, to provoke you to go, I should start, what kind of life should I start living in holiness and godliness as I wait for and as I hasten the day of God? I believe it was, I've been saying there was a volcano eruption in, in India, but I believe it was Indonesia back in December. And there were hikers that were on that volcano, that dormant volcano. My friends, do not treat God like a dormant volcano as if he's not going to erupt at some time. Just think about, the, just think about those hikers that just perished in an instant. They put, their, they put their foot where they thought they could put their foot, and then they were in eternity. What then shall I say when God arises? What then shall I say? It's like, it's like our lives are full of IEDs. Just these improvised, explosive devices that we believe, I'll never step on that. I, yeah, I, I have heard of young people perishing in car crashes, but that, I won't step on that one. I have time. I can... I can, I can wait in my sin a little bit longer. I don't need to repent. Those IEDs won't get me. And it's typically in the moments of carelessness that you step on one. The second passage of Scripture is Psalm 68, verses 1 through 3. And it's, it's, it's of the same kind of nature here. But it helps us think about when God... When God shall arise, it's going to be really bad for his enemies, but it's going to be really good for his people. Psalm 68, verses 1 through 3. God shall arise. That word shall is often not, we don't use it that much, except for like little cliche sayings, but it's supposed to point out certainty, meaning God will assuredly arise. He will. He most definitely will. His enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. Take those images in. Again, unbeliever, think with me. Think about how God... And his glorious grace has appeared in the person of his son in human flesh and has done all the work and offers himself to you news that you have heard, news that you can't understand. You don't need to go across the sea to figure out the meaning of it. It's right before you. It's coming off of my tongue. It's entering your ears. And just think, when God does rise, what are you going to do? God says, It'll be like smoke driven away. You ever seen a, a larger truck, such as like a, a dump truck, hits on the accelerator and thick black smoke comes out of it? In moments, what seemed to be this thick darkness just dissipates into, it's, not, it's as if it was never there. God says, that'll be you if you're my enemy. You'll be like wax before me, and I'm a fire. There's no chance that wax defeats fire. But believer, listen to this. This is verse 3. But the righteous shall be glad. The righteous shall be glad. Those who trust in Jesus will be very happy because they have a blessed hope. And when he appears, they will rejoice. He goes on to say, they shall exult before God. They shall exult before God. What does that mean? Exult with a U, not an A. What does that mean? It doesn't mean like, that was pretty good. Like I saw that movie and it was pretty good. It's more like, I'm going to jump up and down with joy. I'm going to become indecent in my joy. 
because I'm going to be so excited. And the last clause is even better. They shall be jubilant with joy. It's like, it's like joy is ice cream, and then you just put more joy on top of it. It's just You get joy, and then you get a double scoop of joy. Believer, look and listen. Unbeliever, look and listen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us. Truly, you have appeared in your marvelous grace. Truly, you have accomplished all that we need to be reconciled back to you. Oh, Lord, may we not disregard this. May we not treat your word as something that's disposable, but something that is necessary. Oh, may we cling to it. May those who are in this room and who are unbelieving, may those who hear my voice, may you work your precious grace into their hearts and soften them, open their eyes to see and realize this, the ugliness of what they're preferring and to see the beauty of what you are offering in Christ, and save them. And for the believer, the believer who's discouraged and thinking, I'm going through a, a time, Lord, and it just, I don't get why I'm obeying you, and I'm not seeing rewards. I'm obeying you, and I'm not seeing blessings. What is going on? Are you sleeping? May you comfort them. May you comfort them that you shall arise. Oh, Lord, help us. In Christ's name, amen.